This is chapter 16, Human Genetics and the Human Genome. Make sure you check the announcements for what parts of this chapter you are responsible for because I have cut out some of it <clears throat> to reduce your workload to what is absolutely required. I know we're all in a little bit of a time crunch here because it's a shorter quarter. First thing we're going to talk about is pedigrees, and you need to know what these symbols mean for pedigrees. Pedigrees are basically like a um, like the family tree, essentially. So firstly, uh, squares, here's two squares, those represent males always, um, unaffected male and affected male. So if it's colored in like so, that means that the individual is affected. The way I remember uh, which one is uh, affected is that males are, why, why do you have to be so square? Uh, that doesn't make any sense, but for some reason it helps me to remember it. Circles are females, rep represent females, and this circle here means that this female is affected because it's colored in. And then the empty circle here is an unaffected female. Um, a diamond, you'll rarely see this one, so you don't really need to worry about a person whose sex is not known. Uh, perhaps they were, uh, they, they died as a very young child and no, there are no surviving relatives that could tell you. Um, <clears throat> when we connect two uh, circles and squares or something like so from a line horizontally, that means this is a mating or in human terms, a marriage or a reproduct, well, not necessarily a reproductive event, a marriage, a mating. And then when a line goes down like so, that is where we're going to be showing an offspring. So this would be a daughter. And if you want to say that this uh, couple had another offspring and it was another daughter, you need to draw the line um, horizontal and then down. And if you want to add a son, again, like so. Make sure you don't do this uh, because that means that the person has had identical twins if you're drawing a pedigree. Let's take a look at this one. This is an example of a uh, marriage or reproductive event, uh, event between a male and a female producing a son or a male offspring. And then here, same thing with this example, except that here there are two twins. So this is how we represent non-identical twins. And then this would be identical twins down here. And that is all. Here is an example of a couple of pedigrees. So are these dominant or recessive traits? This one on the left is uh, an example of a dominant trait or polydactyly. Sometimes people can have a single nucleotide polymorphism. That means just one nucleotide has been exchanged for another and it causes them to grow an extra finger. <clears throat> so it's called polydactyly, many fingers. And if it is a dominant trait, that means that heterozygotes will be affected. This is the heterozygous uh, genotype affected. And then, of course, homozygous dominant are affected. And then homozygous recessive, that is normal digits. So what we would do is then color in all of the, un uh, if we were interested in writing in the genotypes, we could say all the white circles and squares are unaffected. So they must be all homozygous recessive, as we can see, see here. They are all homozygous recessive. The darker colored ones, sometimes we can deduce them with 100% certainty and sometimes not. The fact that individual 7 here is homozygous recessive means that one of these alleles, <coughs> excuse me, the fact that individual 7 is homozygous recessive means that both of this person's parents had a recessive allele. So this little p came from this parent and is the mother homo, uh, heterozygous or homozygous. We can be certain that the mother is also heterozygous because that is where the second recessive allele came from right here. Ah, I told you so. Even the computer agrees with me. Uh, some individuals we cannot be sure of. So this individual, this son, number five, could be homozygous dominant or could also be heterozygous because uh, the, um, it's possible that they got both of the dominant alleles 
of one from each parent, or they could have gotten one dominant and one recessive. Remember the Punnett squares that we could draw for this kind of cross. It would just be the resulting Punnett square from a heterozygote with another heterozygote. And then we draw the Punnett square, and we know that there's a one in four chance of having a homozygous recessive offspring, male or female, and there'd be a 75% chance of having a uh, affected offspring. Here are the rest of the uh, genotypes. Okay, so <clears throat> is individual number four, is their genotype a certainty? Do we know with certainty that they are heterozygous? And the answer is yes, and that's because individual eight here has uh, is a homozygous recessive. And because they're homozygous, we know that one allele came from each parent. So the little p there came from mom, the little p here came from dad, who must therefore be heterozygous. Uh, they must be heterozygous because they have polydactyly, which means they have at least one dominant allele that is shown right there. Second uh, pedigree on the right. What about this one? Is it dominant or recessive? Can you deduce it? You can pause the video if you want, but now I'm going to show you the answer. This is um, a recessive trait uh, that codes that is called albinism. That means no melanin is produced in the skin. Now, there's some other phenotypic uh, uh, symptoms as well. So anyone who's affected, all of the colored in circles, circles and then there's one square down there, is going to be homozygous recessive. Of that we can be sure because it is a homo, uh, is, is, it is a recessive trait. There we go. Uh, <clears throat> now, the unaffected individuals are always going to be either, uh, as we can see, homozygous dominant or heterozygous. Now, Generally, we can assume if, if, for example, if you sh showed a picture of an individual who does not have albinism, the assumption is that they are not heterozygous. We would assume they're not heterozygous with the understanding that there is a small chance we could be wrong. And the reason for that is these alleles, these alleles, both of them, polydactyly and albinism, are um pretty low frequency, pretty low frequency. That's an abbreviation for frequency there. So they're not that common. So an unknown individual, we would assume is going to be a, an homozygous dominant. We'd assume that knowing we could be wrong. Okay, so let's, uh, let's look at some of the other parts of this pedigree here. So this is an affected num uh, individual, number four. So what about the parents? Can we determine whether we whether they are homozygous or heterozygous with any certainty? Well, first start with what we know. That little a must have come from somewhere, um, must have come from dad. The other one must have come from mom over here. We know that they are not, uh, they do not have albinism, so that means they must have one good copy of the allele. So therefore, we can deduce both of them are heterozygous. And what about this individual down here? Are they going to be uh, heterozygous or homozygous dominant? Can we know for sure? Ask yourself this. And the answer is that we cannot know for sure. All we know is that they are not homozygous recessive because they do not have albinism. So the, the number five could be heterozygous or homozygous dominant. I'll film the rest here. Uh, and uh, I think all the remaining ones we can be absolutely certain about. Uh, yeah, absolutely certain about. Okay, let's take a look uh, just real quickly at number four here. Why is it that we can be certain that this person is heterozygous as opposed to uh, as opposed to homozygous. The reason is that, that one of their this person's parents, number four, is homozygous recessive. So this individual, number four, could only give a little a to all of their offspring. So all of number four's offspring are going to have at least one recessive allele. We know that they um, have at least one dominant allele because we look at the phenotype um, were we to go out and look at them. Uh, we'd look at the phenotype, and if their phenotype is not albino, then we'd say at least one dominant allele. 
What type of inheritance pattern is this? Again, you can pause it and uh, think about it. Now I'm going to give you the answer. And this is really a cruel one. It is a trick question. Probably most of you are able to deduce that it must be recessive. Let me give you another hint though. Uh, male, male, male. Hmm. Only males are affected. Now this is not really enough data to know for certain, but when you see a pedigree and only males are affected, uh, affected <laughs> it is likely that it is a sex-linked trait. And this is, in fact, a sex-linked um, trait. And how do you know? Well, you only know because I'm telling you. Um, and remember that the way we write alleles for sex-linked traits, uh, females, we're always going to have two Xs, and we need to have a superscript that denotes what version of the allele. Males are always going to be an X and a Y, with the X also having a superscript, the Y, simply denoting that it is a male. So hemophilia, <clears throat> going back over this, we've talked a little bit about it already. Um, hemophilia, hemo, that's a Latin word for blood. Phil means love, kind of a weird set of root words, I suppose. But these are people who have, uh, do not, who are missing a certain clotting factor. There are a lot of different types of um, clotting factors that could potentially be dysfunctional, uh, they're missing one of them. And so when they start bleeding, they do not, the, the blood does not clot rapidly, and so they will continue to bleed. This is a light, was a life-threatening disease uh, prior to modern medicine. We now have some treatments that can uh, make people, uh, allow people to live a generally normal, healthy life, and it is sex linked. So, that it is sex-linked means that it must be occurring on the non-homologous region of the X chromosome. That's here or here. And the Y chromosome does not have it. Females have two copies of the allele or the gene. And males have only one copy because the Y chromosome does not carry this allele. So genotypes for this disease. Normal female is written right here, dominant and dominant, written with a capital letter. This is a sex-linked recessive allele. So um, capital letter means dominant allele, coding for normal, healthy phenotype. Next one, this is an affected female, and this would be extremely rare. The reason it's extremely rare is that <clears throat> And this female would have had to have gotten one of these chromosomes from dad, who would have had to have had hemophilia. And prior to modern medicine that uh, allows hemophiliacs to live more uh, normal lives, uh, many people were not able to survive the males until reproductive age. So it was unlikely that a, a male would reproduce. So therefore, females were really unlikely to have this uh, disease. That, um, so anyway, one would have to come from dad, and then the other would have to come from mom. The allele itself is very rare, so it would be pretty rare for two people, both carriers, to have a child. Next, this is a carrier female, or a heterozygote. Carriers are unaffected, but have the potential to have offspring who are affected. Last one, this is a male who's affected. Uh, Lowercase means that, that is the... Um, recessive allele. Here is an example of a modern, uh, the, the royal family. This is Queen Victoria and she was a carrier. This um, half colored in circle means carrier. Carrier. And only females can be carriers for sex linked traits because only they can be heterozygous. So <clears throat> Queen Victoria and Albert had a unaffected daughter, and her name was Alice. Alice and Louise had an unaffected uh, daughter. Again, that was Alexandra, who had a, a child with the Tsar Nicholas II of Russia, who, and they had a son who was affected. Okay, so can we fill in some of the genotypes here? Let's start with Queen Victoria on the top. 
Queen Victoria is a carrier. Remember, she has two X's, and carrier means one healthy allele and one recessive. Albert's a male, so he's got a Y, and he's unaffected, so that means he's got a dominant healthy allele. Alice was affected, so two X's, and excuse me, Alice is not affected, but she's a carrier. So again, same genotype as her mom for this allele, uh, heterozygous. Uh, Luis, let's see, he was unaffected, so and he's a male, and he's got an X, so unaffected, he's going to have a capital H. Alexandra, same thing, uh, 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 unaffected, I'm going to go a little faster here, uh, Czar Nicholas II, he's going to be X, Y, and unaffected, little H. Then Alexis, uh, he's a male, X, Y, he's affected, little H. And I just made, realized I made a mistake with Mr. Czar. He should have had a capital H here. I got a little ahead of myself. Healthy. Capital, capital H. Okay. With that said, let's take a look at this question over here. Alice and Luis have decided to have another child. Who are we talking about? Alice and Luis. Draw a labeled diagram to show the probability of them having a child with hemophilia include genotypic and phenotypic ratios. So this is a practice question, not for the, it's not like a test question, but is a, uh, here to help you understand the content. Now you can draw a Punnett square or just another diagram. Punnett squares are kind of the easiest though. I'm gonna, you can pause and try to do it, but now I'm gonna show you how we would do this. First, draw out the cross. XX, she's a carrier, crossed with, X, Y, he's a male, unaffected. Here's our Punnett square. I hope I'm going to get myself enough room here. There we go. And we'll draw uh, males potential gametes here. Females potential gametes here. And then we fill in the Punnett square. So X, X. Capital H, capital H, X, H, and Y, that's a male, X, X, because, right, one X from here, the other X from there, and let's see, we've got a capital H from dad, lowercase h from mom, so this is a heterozygous carrier, and then last male, so uh, let's see, little h. That means this is an affected male. So drawing a label diagram show the probability of them having a child with hemophilia it looks like it was, let's see, there's one possibility here, and I don't see any other possibility. So that it is a one in four probability or 25% chance. I'm not going to go over the genotypic and phenotypic ratios here. This is a preview of content to come later in the Biology 200 level series. <clears throat> Why is it that we all know this to be true? Inbreeding is bad. In biology, we call it inbreeding depression. Basically, this is it. And this, you do not need to memorize for this class or remember it, but it might help you to kind of understand the bigger picture of biology. Inbreeding depression is an increase in homozygosity in recessive disease-causing alleles due to reproduction between genetically similar or closely related individuals. This is generally a problem with species that are endangered. There's very few of them. For example, um, panthers or cougars in Florida have become, there's, there were so few of them at one point that they were becoming inbred. Their tails were developing these kinks in them. Their hearts were even developing some minor holes between uh, some of the chambers, I believe it was. Uh, so it's a really bad deal. Now uh, this was that same pedigree we just looked at, except with more of it filled in. Again, Queen Victoria of England right here, she was a carrier. And back then, royalty kind of liked to marry other royalty. And the problem was there wasn't that much royalty to go around. So if you look right here, this male and this female were in fact related to each other. This individual's mom was this individual's uh, dad's sister. So not great. And it turns out two of their offspring had hemophilia. 
Notice the this generation here, lots of hemophilia here, and I believe there's even more inbreeding than is shown in this diagram. So uh, yeah, inbreeding is bad. Next topic is sickle cell anemia. In some parts of East Africa, nearly 50% of babies are born as carriers for the HBS allele. An individual who is homozygous has sickle cell anemia, which is, for now, big frowny face. Not fun to have this. Why is this? Here's a map. Sickle cell right here, this is a genetic disease, disease, or an inherited disease. Malaria, on the right there, that is a um, life, I'm not going to write out life-threatening. Uh, it is a life-threatening, often fatal, infectious disease. And, and this is a protozoan or a protist. So um, antibiotics will not kill it. Uh, it's really tough to treat this, and in some forms of it, it will live in your liver for the rest of your life. I believe George Clooney made that uh, famous by getting himself infected with it. You can look that one up, though. So let's take a look at something here. Where does sickle cell anemia occur most? Well, it looks like, let me get the right color here, that it occurs 10 to 20% of people have sickle cell anemia, which is, this, again, big frowny face down here over here over here lots of it and then oh, we'll go just go down to one to five percent and then five to ten percent and say okay so it's like right here uh, all right so that's where this genetic disease is most common and now let's look at where malaria is most common malaria is most common here so this is where it's most common particularly uh, a certain kind of malaria called Plasmodium falciparum. Plasmodium falciparum is a particular species of the malaria genus that is very fatal. There is significant overlap, geographic overlap, where there is malaria and sickle cell anemia. So is there a biological relationship between these two diseases? Let me remind you, malaria is an infectious disease Sickle cell anemia is a genetic disease. People, na Native Americans, for example, they never have sickle cell anemia if they are 100% Native American. Um, people native to Russia, uh, Siberia, they never have sickle cell anemia uh, if they are 100% from that area. So um, why is it that people here, tw up to 20% of them have it? That's that's really unfortunate. So it begs the question, why? A little bit of background. People who are heterozygous have one-third the number of plasmodium parasites in their blood, as do homozygous individuals. Plasmodium, that is the genus name, and the type that is the most fatal is called plasmodium falciparum. Um, I think that's a C. It might be an S. I'm pretty sure it's a C. So they, people who are heterozygous for this allele, that means their genotype would be HBA and HBS. So this one codes for sickle cell anemia, and this one just codes for normal phenotype. Next bullet. In one study, 100 children who died of malaria were screened for the HBS allele. Only one of them had the allele except that it's really common in Africa. So you would expect much more children to have this allele because it's very common. But people who died from malaria, most of them didn't have it. Okay, why is that? Bullet two. There are two selection pressures going on here. That means selection for survival and reproduction. One is malaria, which selects for the HBS allele. So if you have the HBS allele, you're more likely to survive and reproduce and pass on the allele to your offspring. The other is sickle cell anemia, which selects for the HBA allele. Meaning, if you have HBA, HBA, homozygous for this allele, you don't have sickle cell anemia. Isn't that great? So you're more likely to survive and reproduce and pass on the allele to the next generation. Where malaria is present, 
Both alleles are selected for because heterozygotes are the most adapted to this environment. Why is that? Because HBS gives resistance to malaria. Hooray! HBA means you have a normal, healthy phenotype and you don't have sickle cell anemia. So it's like the best of both worlds. Let's break it down into some more details. Number one, this is an example of codominance. Codominance, again, we need to use superscripts. Remember, the notation used, superscripts represent codominant alleles, where the, in heterozygotes, both alleles are expressed. Uh, so in codominance, we have a sort of a mixed phenotype, not an intermediate phenotype, but a mixed phenotype. As we go through the remaining slides, you can try to complete this table, and I would encourage you to copy down this table so that you can keep this straight in your head. We're going to look at the genotype for people with these two alleles, a description of, you know, how would we say it? Well, uh, almost like it's HBA. What does that mean? I'm going to give you this one. HBA. H B A homozygous. So notice the uh, abbreviations for the alleles are a little more complicated, and that's because this is uh, more accurate for how scientists actually uh, describe alleles. So this is one allele here, H B A allele. Phenotype. What's the phenotype going to be? And are they protect protected from malaria? Yes or no? Great. So we're going to move on in a moment. One more thing though. This allele is the hemoglobin gene. The hemoglobin gene codes for a protein that carries oxygen in the blood. There's two copies or two versions of this gene. So we have two alleles. The HBA allele codes for normal hemoglobin, carries oxygen uh, in a normal fashion from lungs to tissues that require oxygen. HBS this is the sickle hemoglobin. So people can be homozygous, heterozygous, uh, and there we go. We're going to move on, and we'll come back to the slide at the end. So phenotypes involved in the hemoglobin gene. Somebody who is homozygous, HBS, HBS, and you can look back at that table here and fill in a little bit of it, is inefficient at transporting oxygen, and the proteins produced from this gene only sickle cell beta globin produced, only that one produced. And remember that um, genes are made of DNA, and DNA codes for, there's this intermediate molecule called mRNA, we're going to skip that for now, they code for proteins, basically. HBA, HBS, this is a heterozygous individual, and one allele produces normal beta globin, that's a part of the hemoglobin molecule, and the other produces sickle cell beta globin. So they have two types of this protein being produced. Both of the alleles are expressed, right, because we've got some of the HBA protein produced and some of the HBS protein produced. And the last one, HBA, HBA, only normal beta globin pr uh, is produced. Physiological differences with HBS. So when combined with oxygen, the beta globin protein behaves the same way in HBS and HBA. So there's no difference, say, in the lungs where there's lots of oxygen and these HBS proteins and HBA proteins are binding to oxygen. No difference. However, when oxygen is not bound to the beta globin protein in HBS proteins, the protein becomes less soluble, and the proteins stick to each other, forming these long fibers inside of red blood cells. They turn into a sickle uh, shape. Sickle meaning that thing that was used to be used to harvest grain, like one of these. Here's the blade, and then this would be the handle, like the Grim Reaper is supposed to carry one, I think. A sickle, sickle cell shape, shape kind of like this part. Um, what was I going to say after that? Uh, right, <clears throat> what happens is HBS, these HBS beta globins pick up oxygen in the lungs and they transport it to places that are low in oxygen, maybe don't have very good 
uh, blood transport, blood flow, like the joints, they drop off oxygen in the joints and then they, um, then they turn into this sickle shape. Then what happens is these sickle cells block small capillaries causing the person to suffer from anemia, which is a lack of oxygen transported to those cells. And that's because these HBS proteins form fibers inside of the red blood cells. Little bit of a different perspective on this. Here's a chromosome. It's an autosome. This is not a sex link trait. We get a single base substitution mutation. What is that? We're going to learn more about it later. But in a normal individual, uh, there's all this DNA, 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 and DNA's got C's, G's, A's, T's, and C's, and all that. Right? Let me check. G, C, T, A. Yep, that's what we have. And this group of three nucleotides is what we're interested in. Here it is CTC, and this produces um, an amino acid called glutamic acid or glutamine. Um, that's one amino acid. Great. So it's one amino acid in this long protein. Here's an amino acid, here's a second amino acid, here's a third amino acid, and there are the hundreds of them. Let's look now at the mutant allele. The mutant allele has had a change, CAC instead of CTC. So we have an A instead of a T. So just one change in the couple, oh, couple, about 2,000 nucleotides, 2,000 ones of these, right? 2,000 G, C, T, C, A, or whatever. Just one change, and what happens is we get a different amino acid at this position in the protein. So we have one amino acid, second amino acid, third amino acid. And because it's a different amino acid here, it causes uh, hemoglobin to, rather than be this globular protein like so, that's just floating nicely dissolved in the water, it um, it causes them to polymerize into these long fibers, which in this red blood cell would essentially be like this. They're all they've polymerized, and these long fibers that are sort of spear-like um, will, will make the red blood cell elongate, forming a sickle-like structure. And it is actually theorized, I think it's not known for certain, that these long polymers of beta globin or hemoglobin um, actually will stab malaria parasites if they are inside of the red blood cells, which ruptures the protist cell membrane, thus killing it. Glutamic acid and valine, comparing the two. So if you look at this amino acid and this amino acid, we can see central carbon, amine group, carboxylic acid, Central carbon, same thing, right? This is always the same in all amino acids. And then we have the R group. This is an R group on valine. And then this is an R group on glutamic acid. And the difference is this. Glutamic acid is polar, which means it's more water soluble. Valine is nonpolar, which means it's less water soluble. So what happens is they all clump together like so. Uh, and become these long spears or fibers inside the red blood cells, which causes the red blood cells to not function correctly. Sickle cell disease. I'm going to let you read through this slide. I'm not going to read it to you. It's basically the same thing I said. Take a look over here, though, at this. These sickle-shaped um, red blood cells, like that one right there, uh, they cause agglutination, which is happening right here. That means these little capillaries, a capillary is the smallest blood vessel, become blocked and blood cannot continue to flow. So it deprives certain areas of the body of oxygen, which leads to all sorts of problems. So here are your answers to that table. And I think you could have written a lot more than this. And if you did, great. Let's look at some of the basics, though. A het person who is heterozygous uh, for HBA, HBS, they've got one copy of each allele. We can say that they are a carrier. We can say that they have protection from malaria. That's definitely a plus if you live in an area that has malaria. 
And we can also say that they are going to be healthy. They don't have sickle cell anemia. So that's also a plus. People who are heterozygous, they are selected for. They have a reproductive advantage. They have had a reproductive advantage for a long time. So they've reproduced more than homozygous individuals with the HBA because these people can uh, get malaria, which is really bad. They're not protected, and that malaria kills millions of people every year. People who are homozygous for HBS, this one's also selected for and uh, uh, selected against, sorry, because th these people have sickle cell disease, so they are a little less likely to survive and reproduce offspring, transmitting the allele to the next generation. So there becomes sort of a balance between these three uh, genotypes, which are being selected for, and there is a heterozygote advantage because they are healthy, don't have sickle cell anemia, and are immune to malaria, so they're more likely to have offspring. But that maintains the HBS allele in the population because it does provide these people with um, an advantage. So unfortunately, sometimes, you know, if you call, if two people who are carriers reproduce, then one in four of their offspring will have sickle cell anemia. For example, if we have a carrier and someone who is affected by the disease, <coughs> carrier is going to be heterozygous, affected, homozygous, HBS, HBS. Sorry, this the, that should be a lowercase s too, just HBS, HBS. No difference in the s there. Um, and we're going to have 50% of them being carriers, healthy heterozygotes, and then 50% would also have sickle cell anemia. Another example, two carriers, which I was talking about earlier, if they reproduce, one in four will have sickle cell anemia, one, two out of four, so that's written right down here, two will be heterozygotes, and they will be immune to malaria and also be healthy, and then one in four will not be immune to malaria, but will not have sickle cell anemia either. So again, the heterozygotes in areas that have malaria uh, could be said to be the most reproductively fit, which is why this allele exists. Sickle cell and natural selection. <clears throat> I got a little ahead of myself, so I uh, already discussed it, so we're going to skip, skip that one. Cystic fibrosis, and this is a, a genetic disease that occurs most commonly in people with European descent. Cystic fibrosis. Uh, I'm going to let you read through the symptoms here, and you can pause the video to take a look at that. I'm going to skip that and skip to this. The recessive allele is called the CFTR allele, and 1 in 25 people in the USA are carriers. So, it's pretty common. If you know that you are a carrier, you may want to have your uh, 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 the person who you are considering having children with tested. That is somewhat of a hot topic. But anyway, the technology is out there to be tested. The life expectancy of somebody who has cystic fibrosis is about 38 years old. Uh, typically, um, they will come down with a serious type of lung infection as their lungs accumulate more and more mucus and they have more and more trouble breathing. By the way, I'm 38 this, uh, uh, this year, so wow, you know, what, it's a sad disease to have, just like sickle cell anemia. So a little bit of a review and an attempt to connect this to other topics that we have studied in biology. So. <clears throat> It codes for a chloride ion channel. And what those symptoms that you read about on the last slide were, were, were basically uh, ducts in various parts of the body uh, begin to get clogged. Your lungs are essentially a collection of many small ducts with also these sacs called alveoli. Those also get clogged. So we'll just take uh, as an example, generally a duct could be also the duct leading from the testicles to the urethra, which enables males to reproduce. And if it gets blocked, well, they can't reproduce. So what's going on here? This is a duct and these are cells. That's a cell. This is a cell. This is a cell. 
Oh, look over here. That's another cell. They are lining the duct. They're lining this duct. Okay, so in healthy individuals, and I have talked about this a little bit before, uh, they have these chloride ion channels, chloride ion channels, which allow Cl minus to diffuse out, and this increases the solute concentration. Solute concentration goes up. So if there is a <clears throat> excuse me, high solute concentration outside of the cells, what that means is that H2O is also going to diffuse out of these cells, maybe through some other channels, a little bit through the cell of the phospholipid bilayer as well. H2O diffuses out, and this makes the mucus that is lining the um, pretty much all tubes, there's a mucus lining, it makes it less thick. So if water is, um, if water is diffusing out, it makes the mucus less thick so that it can be removed and the duct can transport whatever it is it is transporting. If, <clears throat> uh, no, that's not what I wanted to say. Let me move on to the next thing, which is this topic here, diploid and heterozygote. So remember, in the nu nucleus right here, we should have two copies of every gene, unless it's a sex-like gene. Two copies. So in heterozygotes, so um, let's say an individual's big C, little c. So they are a carrier for the CFTR gene. This one functioning allele is going to code for enough chloride ion channel proteins so that enough chloride ions can diffuse out and it will maintain a high solute concentration outside and water will also diffuse out. We get a normal phenotype. So that's why this disease is recessive because the recessive allele is a loss of function for that protein. So, as, so the allele for cystic fibrosis isn't doing something bad. It's just not doing anything. It's a loss of function mutation. So that's why heterozygotes still have a normal phenotype. So again, but again, we must consider why is it that this is so common, one in 25 in the U.S., why is it so common? The answer, again, is that it gives resistance to a couple of diseases. CFTR gene and natural selection. It gives resistance to, to diseases such as cholera and typhoid fever. Why? Because um, typhoid fever, this was not mentioned in your book, but typhoid fever, it's a bacteria, and for it to get inside of your cells, it binds to the chloride ion channel. It's got, it binds to them, and then it gets into your cells. <laughs> Heterozygotes have less ion channels. And so typhoid fever is not as able to get into the cells. It still does get in, but the immune system is more able to fight off the disease, which makes individuals who are heterozygous more reproductively fit in environments that have typhoid fever and also a similar story with cholera. This is known as heterozygote vigor, and I believe your textbook doesn't mention it, so um, you don't need to commit yourself to memorizing it, but it might help you to understand what's going on with this disease. Why is it that uh, <clears throat> this genetic disease is so common in people with European ancestry? The reason is the past and natural selection. So because of uh, heterozygote surviving and having more offspring, this allele is passed down to the next generation more often, and this changes the allele frequency in the population, so we get people or populations such as the American population having an increased um, risk to, to this genetic disease, because in the past, uh, these infectious diseases were preying on individuals who didn't have the protection given by the CFTR cystic fibrosis allele. That was a mouthful. Uh, feel free to post questions about how this 
uh, works with sickle cell anemia and cystic fibrosis in the discussion forum. And I hope you thought this lecture was useful to you. Um, have a nice day.